Hello everyone, my name is Matthew and on behalf of the organisers Oliver Kinross, I'd like to welcome you all to the latest Festival of BIM and Digital Construction webinar. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of our sponsors, but with special mention of Build Dots, our sponsor for today's session. Today's webinar will feature a presentation on construction 2025. There will be time for Q&A at the end, so take the opportunity to, to submit all your questions in the questions box on your screen. And I'd now like to pass over to Aviv for his presentation. Thank you, Matthew, and uh, hello, everyone. Let's just see that the camera comes up here. There we go. So I'll share my screen with you real quickly, and we can get started. OK, so first of all, uh, once again, thank you, everyone, for joining. I will say that I will do my best to answer questions as they come up uh, in the chat if I if I can while I'm speaking. So feel free to, to ask me to ask me questions during and not not this week for the end. Okay, so a bit about me. Um, oops, sorry, this jumped here. So I am one of the three co-founders of this company, Build Dots. Uh, we've been around for a couple of years, and I'm the chief product officer, so I'm in charge of basically uh, basically deciding what the product will do and what sort of features and value it will give our, our clients. Prior to Build Us, I was uh, I was a uh, I was I was I was a lot of, a long time in, in the tech industry, let's call it, not not in construction specifically, but a lot of complex uh, complex software products from from various kinds. And uh, and then we, we started this. And I think we we came in to bring uh, a lot of let's call it very a lot of our knowledge let's call it, from the previous, from our previous lives in the tech world into construction uh, to try and, and really build something significantly. So first, before I talk about um, 2025, maybe, oh, sorry, just keep moving around here. Um, I'll speak about why, why is 2025 a thing? Why is this something that, that I'm going to mention and why is it the title? Why are we speaking about this at all? So I think that when we're looking to the future, and we're specifically saying 2025, but being another number, we're basically speaking about a better future. We're looking for a better future. We're looking for change. And why do we need change? We need change because as an industry, we suffer from a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of very very significant what's called difficulties. These some of these are mentioned here: low productivity, low margins, uh, basically everything that, that we all know, but the point here is that the industry is constantly looking for improvement, looking for change. And what has actually been happening is that while construction has become more and more complex and more and more difficult to do, uh, seeing as the tools and methods have not evolved enough with it, we're actually at, at a, getting to a more and more difficult place with time. And we're looking at the future and imagining, imagining a, a better world. And for me, I think that usually, when we do that, when we're looking to this future, we're looking at very, very sophisticated sort of technologies mentioned here. So, of course, robots are always the first thing we think about a uh, future that you think is 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 far. When you think about about robots doing some of the tasks. You're thinking about uh, improvements to to how humans work, whether it's exoskeletons or hololens or stuff like that. Um, a lot of sophist more sophisticated methods of construction, prefabrication, 3D printing, um, perhaps new materials that, that come, come about and will come about. Um, and all the, these different things, which I think that for me, when I look at it, I think that that's when people look at the future, that's what they think, right? That's what we've been uh, told by, uh, by movies and Hollywood. And that's what we think about what, what will be different in 2025 or what we hope for. But truthfully, First of all, 2025 is four years away, four years in the bit. So it's not really that much time to get all this done. Um, and realistically speaking, I think at least that when we look at this future, what, what will we have truly within the construction process? Yes, maybe a handful of robots, but very specific ones, doing very specific tasks. So you can already see um, cleaner bots or robots that are starting, starting to do things like uh, brickwork or something, but very, very specific task oriented uh, and not this uh, cool sort of Terminator that can walk around and do whatever it wants. 
some use of offsite construction, which we already have today, of course, but uh, we would we would expect that to, to increase, but not to take over because um, we could probably never, but especially not in such a short term, reach a place where everything or even the majority of things are construct, uh, constructed offsite. 3D printing, yes, perhaps, um, but again, if you ask me at least, probably not an entire building or an entire structure, but rather maybe very specific things, uh, limited use for specific elements that require that it on site and where it can work. And of course, design and planning tools that are always evolving and will keep evolving. So all this I think is realistic and that's what we could really expect but more importantly, and maybe the biggest item is control. So if we think about all those, all those items that I mentioned in the first slide, the margins, the, uh, the delay, the productivity, all of this, I think the key factor that could, could influence this in control is control. Maybe if I stop here to tell a bit about how we, how we started build offs, when we did this, I think we, the three of us, the people founders, came in and looked at this, it's called this situation, where uh, a management team on site need to manage the construction process, needs, need to control that process, need to know what is going on and therefore decide what to do next. And the tools to do that are, uh, I'll be nice and say limited, because basically there aren't any. I always say that the tools to do that are to walk around with your feet, look with your eyes and, and see what's happening and then try and derive a plan moving forward from that. And that situation is one that is, uh, I think that's what drove us to really build, to build, build us because uh, my passion in, in this is to create, to create a world, let's call it, uh, without being uh, too dramatic, where these managers on site can really use, first of all, have the data presented to them with no effort, and then can truly use that to understand what to do next and can look at it from a, a, a 2020 sort of, uh, sort of way, uh, much like in other industries that have these, uh, these control centers and have all of this already. And when you look at the future, this 2025, again, it's still very, very critical. It's critical today, but it will be critical in the future because we might think, we might believe that once we have a prefabrication fully implemented and robots instead of the workers and everything, uh, and that's it. We don't, we don't really need any control measures uh, at this point because it's a, it's a factory that runs itself. But first of all, factories have very sophisticated uh, control measures. So we're looking at um, the wider industry to, to learn something then probably probably not. And secondly, um, still, as I mentioned before, we're not looking yet at the future where everything is fully automatic. So the key, I think, is this final sentence, the right data at the right time, which allows managers to make decisions based on something concrete and therefore in a better way. Why is this difficult? What is holding us back? I mentioned uh, a few things here. There are probably, probably we can, we can together think of a few more, but basically the idea is that construction is a, unlike what the, I think some, some people might think is a very, very, very complex process. Uh, a lot of, a lot of activities, a lot of people, a lot of uh, logistics going around. And this situation, some of it is very, very difficult to control. I think in, not in construction terms, but in, in broad terms, it, it is a very complex one. There are a lot of details, uh, and that's that's where th where things go wrong. And the fact that everything is so complicated and is so difficult, and and we have a limited management manpower. We all know that. We all know that we're we're missing managers on sites, um, and we're reluctant to bring on more due to margins, due to a lot of other things. It's a very difficult very difficult position all in all. But um, part of what I'm here to tell you today is that you don't necessarily need to wait for 2025. Um, a lot of this is already, to, is already available, it's already here today. Um, so I can speak from my own experience saying that today's technology, today's sensors and AI and others 
can truly create a, a situation where you already now have control of what's going on. Control systems are out there. Uh, I represent one of them, but there are others. And, and, and it's here and it's now, and this, it can be done. And the idea, again, going back to my previous point, is that if we track the process at a level, at a granularity level, as other industries do, then we can manage it at that level, and then we can truly create um, very, very, very significant productivity gains. So why, why is it important already today? And then maybe going back to why is it important uh, four years from now? So first of all, I think the whole, the whole concept is productivity. But if we break it down, we're looking at areas where no work is being done. And we all know this happens. But it's difficult. It's difficult to keep an eye out for that. It's difficult to catch it when it happens. It's difficult to react and know what we can do about it. Um, a lot of rework. Uh, I don't need to. Probably don't need to say much more about that. We all know. And the whole idea again is that the lack of information affects everything we do. So it's difficult to just make decisions. It's difficult to allocate resources. It's difficult. Um, it's difficult to create trust and to work together in collaboration between different maybe uh, business units, let's call it, because it's all sort of subjective. All of this can be solved today. That is uh, part of what I'm here to tell you. It's out there and it can be done. And once the information is gathered in a very real and precise way, and it's out there, I can tell you, because uh, we're one of the companies that do that, then all of this can change. And then if we go to 2025, um, going back to my, one of my previous points, again, it will still be required because it will actually be even more required. And why, why do I say that? Because the current situation is one where um, we have a lot of uncertainty on sites, a lot of things that are going on. And the way we handle it today is, yes, maybe, maybe not in the, uh, in the most efficient way, but the way we manage to handle it is by humans using their judgment and using their intuition and, and making prompt decisions on what needs to be done and how they can move forward. But a machine can't really do that. Um, if you robot in a room where it's meant to do something, and tell it to do it. Uh, and if it manages to understand that it can't do that yet because there's some prerequisites that hasn't been completed, then it will, it will just pretty much be stuck and, and not know what to do. So the situation is an example of that. Let's say we have, uh, and, and this is actually another example that can, can be relevant already today because there are such robots that can plaster walls. And let's say that um, the walls are being built by a human worker because robots can't do that yet. And someone builds the wall and then there's a robot that comes in to, to plaster or to take a joint or to uh, whatever it is on top of the wall. Now, because the dry liner is a human and doesn't exactly report very, very specific progress, because we all know that that's the case, then the robot can't know when, when the job is ready for it. And again, this is something that today, if I go back to this sense of intuition, is solved because people walk around on sites and you see workers walking around trying to understand what it is that they want to do now, and they will go to the second floor because that's what was agreed a week ago, something like that. And then they see that the work is not available there and will find, will find sort of what to do. Is that ideal? Uh, no, this sort of brings me back to why we need control today already, because that could create problems. The problems in the process, it could be something that we're not meant to do yet, but this person makes a decision to do that. Um, but still, at least in on most cases, it is progressing. It is something that, that that a situation that a human can handle, where a robot would just sit tight and and wait for uh, further instructions. Let's call it. So, what is, with all that said, the true uh, the true meaning, the true exciting, truly exciting part, so to speak, about the future, is this idea of control. Is that what? Today, yeah, I'm saying that it's already here today, but once we go through, through this process of learning as, a, as an entire industry, the, the, 
the tech side of things and the people who provide the tech and the, and the people on sites and the people at headquarters and the designers and everyone. We learn how to work in this, uh, in this new world where information is always available, then suddenly um, we will truly have control and everything can change. So knowing the exact status of each project mentioned here is a concept um, that sounds trivial, but it's so difficult to do today. We don't know the exact status of each project. We all know these stories of projects that uh, are running for uh, 30 months and they're all on time, on time, on time all along. And then suddenly in the last half year, they become super late. How does that happen? It happens because we didn't know the real status of the project in those original 30 months. It's not that they were, that it was on time for 30 and then lost track in the last six. We just didn't ex know exactly what's going on because of all the details, because of all the complexities that we didn't capture correctly. And once you know the high level status and can get to each detail to understand the causes of that status and then act on it at any level, again, you know, a client level, subcontractor level, designer, anyone, then, then the way we do, we do everything can be very, very different. And this is even before I mentioned this last point here, which is using data from that was collected, that was captured during uh, many, many projects of different kinds and sort of joining that together to create very, very valuable insights. This could be at the enterprise level. You could look at a main contractor with uh, 50 or 100 sites operational and you gather data from all these sites and understand where are your bottlenecks? Where are, are places where your teams um, underperform? Uh, which subcontractor works best? And all of this can be possible once you have the, the information. Once you have the information and some track record with it. So a year, two, five um, into the future. What would this mean for uh, construction sites, for the site level, for the site team? So first of all, um, this is all about controlling what's going on and making sure that we, we are where we should be. So it's knowing when you're when something happens, when something happens unlike what you planned. Plan could be um, your plan for next week or, uh, or the design or anything else and acting on it early. The, the importance of acting early on, on any sort of event is very, very significant. This is something that we have seen on, on projects where we already operate, we see that whether it is uh, a small snag, an NCR, any sort of issue uh, of work that is being delayed, uh, an apartment or two or a floor that stands there waiting for, for work and, and nothing happens. Any one of these examples and many more, if you handle them early, and you can only handle them early if you know immediately, then the, the difference between doing it then and doing it later on, whenever we will uh, come to understand that, is very, very significant for the process as a whole and actually for, for the people on site as well, because it creates a much better and much more controlled environment. So again, a lot of examples here, but uh, the whole point is that once you know at the site level what's going on, once you know where you are versus your critical path, once you know this notion of available work areas, once you understand what's going on and can immediately act on it, then we will reach the holy grail, of course, which is increasing margins and, and saving some time. And I will add to that maybe creating an environment where everyone's work life is better because we truly collaborate, because uh, we are not uh, blindsided by something that suddenly happens that nobody saw coming because of all, all sorts of different reasons. And then we look uh, above the specific project and specific site and at the enterprise level. I think that construction uh, is one of the industries where control at an enterprise level is the most difficult. Um, it's probably, you know, it's probably something we all know, uh, giving, uh, giving giving it the situation with, uh, with things like Aurelian and, and other, other events that we've had. But it's, it's very difficult to control projects 
that are one-offs at some location with a specific team gathered for that. Um, sort of the, the ability to know what's going on or uh, what's called the construction CEO is, is far, far less and it's much more complicated than for, wouldn't, I wouldn't know to say any other industries, probably most other industries. And then again, once you get that, just get that because if you have a system, if you have methods that gather the exact status and the information from all of your projects and you have that in the enterprise level, then suddenly that whole um, control problem at that level goes away. And you can do a lot of things with it. You can reduce your risk because you know what's going on truthfully with every project. And if there's a problem somewhere, again, now not at the small project snag level, but at the big enterprise project level, handle that early and make sure it doesn't become something that could, could realistically, realistically sort of finish your business, let's call it. Um, so, so, but, so that's that, but that's just the first step. After you do that, and after, you, again, you gather this information through time, then suddenly you have real accurate data that can be used to improve how we do everything. You can build more realistic programs, what the, the truthfully sort of correlate to what's happening on sites, and that we can know that this program is something that is meant to happen as is. Any deviation from that might truly be uh, something to look out for, whereas today we all know that maybe the program is not, is not detailed enough, is not accurate enough, is not in touch enough with what's really going to happen to do that. We can compare performance, we can choose the right supply chain for the right project, we can understand who does what best and who fits in any sort of scenario, and then use everything, our, our supply chain, our materials, our use the design, use uh, the management team, use everyone and everything uh, in the right place and at the right time and, and choose wisely. And just basically improve everything we do and, and constantly learn and, and become, uh, let's call it a management industry. How does that speak to, to this whole concept of, uh, of these cool new technologies that, that I mentioned before? Actually, it's, it's a requirement. Um, that's part of what I'm saying, because again, going back to that one example of that robot, but that robot can't know what to do without control. So that's true for anything. Once the process is truly controlled and it's truly managed, then it's easy to integrate a robot or a 3D printer to do something or any, any other thing. But it can only happen if we know how to implement it within a, a managed process, because that's the only way to input such technologies, implement such technologies, sorry. And the only way that we can truly know is it working or not and improve and where to implement it is again, if we have this very real very real status and information about what's going on. And all of this combined together, of course, will give us this future that we're looking for, where everything is, is new and different and uh, much, much better, hopefully. So finally, when I look at uh, 2025, just to sum up sort of, what am I saying? I'm saying that control is key. It will allow us to do everything better it will allow us to be proactive which is of course a, a very known idea but proactive rather than, rather than reactive which is very significant make better decisions to use to use data to make those decisions use data to explain those decisions so everyone is on board and and understand what's happening and basically to improve every day and truth be told if i go back to what robots can, can i do probably not how to find the robot yet um perhaps uh, perhaps bit after that. That's just for me. Thank you very much. Uh, I will open it up now to any questions from the audience. Thanks, Aviv. So yeah, we have had a few questions from the audience. And if everyone in the audience would like to submit questions as well now, we'll get through as many as we can in the time that we have. Um, so the first question we've had is, do you think that the construction industry has and will always lag behind other industries in the adoption of tech, or has COVID provided a bit of a kick for those who were slow on the uptake? So I get asked that question a lot. 
Um, I get asked that question by construction people and by non-construction people. And typically, uh, non-construction people think that, oh, there's no tech in construction because, because construction people don't use tech. I don't think that's the case. Uh, and that's why I don't think that, I think COVID uh, did open some eyes. But even before that, for a long time, I would say, uh, no real tech or no sophisticated tech was implemented in construction because no real tech was was offered or provided. So in that world, it was not so much that the industry didn't adopt tech, rather they didn't have what to adopt. And I think we see in the last six, five, 10, depending on how you look at it, years, that it's really happening. Uh, I can say that when we started two years ago, we were told by people in the industry, oh, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. This is the time to create tech for construction because the industry is there. So I would say, yes, it is. If you look at the, the absolute numbers or, or something like that, an investment in tech or stuff like that, it is a bit behind, but it's just because it's so new to the industry. And I think the major players now understand the importance of it. I, I can speak from experience that I see this all the time. We meet people and they, and we meet contractors and designers and everyone and clients. And they understand that this is a big thing and that, that they're looking to, to be part of it. And yes, COVID has maybe given it an extra nudge, but uh, it's not that things were that bad before in terms of how people see it and how they act. Right, thank you. Um, so another question um, related to COVID is, how do you think the industry would have looked like in 2025 if COVID hadn't happened, would tech play as big a part as it might in the future post-COVID? So, you know, if I if I connect to my previous answer, yes, I think I think so. I think that the movement forward is happening, uh, happened, and will happen regardless. I don't think uh, it would have had a very significant. Uh, I don't think it, it is having a very significant effect one way or the other. Um, I think I think it's causing all sort of local anomalies, whether it is uh, projects that are happening or not happening and influencing the industry in general, but also the adoption of tech. Um, but but hopefully this will this will end soon, and then moving forward, uh, it, it won't be such such a such a big effect on on this as uh, as you might think. Perfect. Uh, so another question we've had is, how could any robotic system minimize the lack of transparency? Would the cost of developing such a AI know how to be extra proportionate against developing commercial, technical and site-based knowledge and ethical attitude? And have you developed any AI systems managing the entire contract process, particularly in JCT and NEC types? Yeah, so first, I don't think, uh... I think part of what I'm saying is that uh, any robotic system, as in the robot building something, is not what will help uh, this notion of control and process management. It might help because a, a robot might, if you give it a very, very specific task, uh, might be less prone to error because it's a robot. Um, but, but even that is still, still questionable. And I, I can say from our own experience, what we've built, our product is an AI system that doesn't actually build anything. It is an AI system that is used to gather data. It doesn't build anything and, it, and neither does it, uh, neither does it, let's call it, uh, manage the process. It doesn't say what needs to be done. It, it can never do that. This, the idea of building, building the knowledge, building the knowledge within, within the industry, within the people in the industry will always be key. Our system, to, to give an example, um, quickly you walk around with a camera attached to your hard hat and it gives you a very accurate, very accurate status of what's going on. Uh, what is done, what is not done, what is done incorrectly, where do you have things that are delayed, where are things going uh, quicker than planned, um, less and, and et cetera, et cetera, and all, all sorts of data points around the process itself and the status. But all this is, at the end of that, is, is the status. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't build anything, and it doesn't make any decisions. You still need the, uh, the QS to use that data to, to 
to manage the contracts. You still need the planner to use that data to create to create a, a draft line and the program moving forward. You still need the, the operations teams to use the data to make the decisions and, and change something, to plan next week differently, to, to allocate resources in, a, in an ideal way, to, to discuss things with, the, with their supply chain and, and maybe, maybe create a, a better plan for the near and, and mid, midterm sort of the process on site. But in all of that, I think we, I, I specifically saw on many sites that were operational that that is happening. Things are changing. People from suddenly, managers on site suddenly use information to do everything that they've done before in a more efficient and more accurate way. But still, it's those managers and their knowledge that is key to making it happen. Uh, I don't think that will change in 2025. I don't think that will change in 2050. Thank you. Um, so another question is, how do you think the industry will need to deal with some of the potential fallout from adopting tech solutions, e.g. workers being replaced by tech, data issues, the cost and time of reskilling? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Again, it's one that comes up a lot. First, I, I, think, uh, I think that we're very, very, very far away uh, from, even the, from even the potential of these costs. Um, it might sort of, sort of connect to what I said about 2025, but I think it will be a long time before, before we, can, we can say, oh, you know what, we're at a point where we can reduce manpower. We're actually at a shortage of everything, of, of workers, of labor, of managers, of, of everything. And the help of, of uh, tools or robots or software, or whatever it is, will only help that sort of improve on that situation, that's one thing. And then the other is that I think if we take a look at basically any other industry that has gone through a process where significant tech has come in, it has pretty much never resulted in, in needing less people. It usually results in needing more because when things are done in a perhaps more efficient way, then suddenly, and suddenly things, and suddenly a lot more is needed to keep up, let's call it. So yes, it could be that we are a few years away from robots doing 80% of brick work in, 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 in our projects, but in a very specific way. But all that will mean if they're truly that efficient and if they're not, they won't be, they won't be implemented is that suddenly we need to keep up and other things need to happen at the same pace and quality. And, and people might, you know, I think the skills might change a bit, um, but not in a very significant way. I don't see that really happening. I, I actually see everything just, just evolving and becoming more and more, more and more important to, to have more and more people and the right people. Perfect. So it looks like we've got two questions uh, left. So the first one is, how did you get started with BuildDot? And what's been some of the biggest challenges you faced in getting off the ground? Yeah, so uh, well, when we, we just started, um, we, looked at, we looked at this industry and we were looking to implement our knowledge and our expertise to do something that can truly, truly help construction. Now, Part of what we had in mind is that we really wanted to be involved in what's happening on site. We believe that that's where the biggest challenges uh, are that the industry is facing, and, and we wanted to be a part of, of helping with the biggest challenges. So we looked at the process on site and what goes on there and, and what's happening, and we had all sorts of, of ideas and, and things, but then I think that what changed is what we visited a few construction sites, um, specifically doing an open doors tour uh, in, in London. And we visited, I think, around a dozen different sites uh, in the London area. And we looked at all of these and said, well, uh, I remember myself saying, this situation of, of these managers here, this team that are trying to manage this, this project, it's sort of like taking five, 10 guys sending them you know sending them to fans and saying oh go conquer europe please 
here are a few sticks, here are a few stones, and good luck with that. So it became very, very obvious for us that, wow, this, this is something that we can help with. And it's something that plays well with our abilities because we know how to build uh, complex data, data, data solutions and, and AI and all of that, things that are involved in our, in our solution. And what has been the, the biggest challenge? I think the biggest challenge that, that we have had and are still having is creating the, it's probably the, the biggest challenge of any tech company, but it's creating the best product that, that fits the process uh, best. Because as I said before, I think the, the, construction, the construction process per project is very, very unique and it's very, very complex. And we're building a, a product that uh, is meant to and actually already does facilitate decision-making all this on all projects, whether it is a two-floor commercial fit-out or a, a 300 and something units residential scheme. And to understand the complexities of any every site and every project and every workflow on site and build a system that can adapt to all of this and can be truly useful for the people on this site and on that site uh, is something that I think is is not only the biggest challenge, it's, it's, the, it's the most important thing. Because again, uh, the only way that this, this or any other tech will be significant is that if it sort of connects well to the workflows and to what people, these people on site are already doing and what, what they know how to do and their knowledge, because that's the only way that we will truly get a return out of it. So we've got time for just one more question. Um, so. This person asks, you've mentioned you've received a lot of positive response from people regarding what BuildDots is doing, but have you faced any skeptics and what were their main concerns? Um, yes, so definitely. Uh, actually, not, not as, as much as I expected, but uh, definitely. A, um, some people just don't, don't believe that the product can truly, uh, can truly do what we say it can do. Um, I mean, obviously, we show a demo, but, uh, but people, people, we can say that people know that demos can be perhaps far from, from what, uh, what the real, real situation is. So we have seen people that see us presenting uh, this tech and we say, okay, so you walk around however you want, wherever you want with the camera, and then you get this. And there you go. It tells you that that wall is installed incorrectly and that socket is 300 mil out of position. And you're 62% done on bylining of this floor, and that's too slow compared to your plan. Something like that. And they look at this and say, there's no way, there's no way that this can really do that just from this video. Um, typically, we then say, okay, let's have a test run. Let's, let's, let's see that it, it does that together on, on one of your projects. That has been uh, a main thing. And I think another was sometimes people think that, that, okay, they believe in the tech, but they don't think that their colleagues will. They find it difficult to believe that uh, the team on site will be able to use it, for instance. Um, why? Because the team on site, some, some think that the team on site is just less technological and will have difficulties with it. But mostly it's about saying, well, but a site team, everything going on, there's no way that they can truly use a tool and, and make the most out of it um, and with all this data. And I think that's why part of our of the challenge that I mentioned before is for us to create it in a way that the key things, the key information is just there. And you can immediately use it. And there's nothing holding you back from, there's nothing that, that, is, that requires too much work with the tool. Because if the tool itself required a lot of work to handle, then I suppose that skepticism would be correct, would be justified, and people on site truly wouldn't use it. But we built it and we are building it in a way that is is meant is meant primarily for these people on site, which is why I think it works. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for presenting as well today, Aviv, and for joining us. And thank you to everyone in the audience as well who's joined us today. So everyone will receive an on-demand copy of today's webinar um, by email within the next 24 hours. 
and don't forget to tune in for our next session which is taking place um, later this week on October the 21st and this will be a panel discussion on how to unite your project information. You can register for this and all of our other upcoming sessions on the Festival of BIM and Digital Construction website. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you everyone and stay safe. Thank you.